Daniel, thank you so much for joining us here at the PSA's investment conference. We're living in tricky geopolitical times. The yes. landscape is a hard one to navigate. How do pension companies even begin to do that? And what do you see as the position well, at the moment? It is quite difficult because people have wildly varying theories about the impact of some of these very big events. And you do have to take a position. Obviously, the Office of Budget Responsibility took some quite punchy, in my view, positions on growth. Uh, and everybody has to take their own view about whether they think that's correct or not and to try to navigate through what they think will happen. I think that um, we're going to go through quite a bumpy period, uh, not just because um, of Brexit, but also because you know we've had several years of uninterrupted growth. Even looking at the budget figures, you can see that they have seen a sort of slowdown in growth. So I think even a more optimistic view suggests that will happen, but it could be more bumpy than that. And obviously, if you are risk averse, you should plan on that basis. There's also European elections ahead as well. So we could be heading for even more unstable times in terms of the political outlook. Yes. I mean, what's happened in um, Britain and in America and in Italy, and you can see happening in Holland, will continue to happen. The decision companies, I suppose, have to make is how much difference will that make to governing structures. Obviously, it's produced Brexit. Obviously, it's produced Trump. I think, although it's possible that it could produce Le Pen and could produce Wilders, it's not actually the central likelihood. My expectation is that France will not end up uh, with Le Pen as president, that they won't end up with Geert Wilders as prime minister. The question that we have to wonder though is whether or not that will persist. So this time these people may do well but lose. Will that always be the case? What impact will all this have on the economy here and, and the long term planning for pension companies looking after all of our money for the future? I'm a long term optimist about global international capitalism. I think it has a great record. It's lifted people out of poverty. It's made the middle class more prosperous. I think it's made us actually more socially tolerant and we've got better public services. And this is controversial. I think it's made us more compassionate, too, oddly enough. But although I'm an optimist in the medium to long term. It's very challenging in the short term. You can see that a lot of forces have arisen that question whether global capitalism has been a good thing. Sometimes they question the capitalism, sometimes they question the globalization, sometimes they question both. And there's going to be a political argument about that. So in the short run, I think I'm a pessimist and in the long run, I'm an optimist. Do you think because of that, it's going to be hard for companies to resist perhaps the knee-jerk reactions to things and, and be more short-termist when there, sh there should be a long-term view, really? Yes. I Look, um, everyone will take their own view. I think that the United Kingdom economy is fairly robust. I think international trends suggest that we will have more trade internationally. And as we have more trade internationally, that we will build international relationships in order to achieve that. And therefore, we can see what's happening immediately as being very challenging, but as a bump in the road, even if quite a big bump. Um, and I think that is the right way to look at it. But obviously, you know, you, you have to manage your uh, funds and you have to manage your corporate responsibilities in the reasonable, realistic, short run where you can see, you know, and um, Keynes's comment in the long run, we're all dead. That is true to some extent, you know, you can't be planning for some long term future that you know, none of your uh, contributors or none, and none of your recipients are ever going to see. And with that in mind, is it quite hard for those companies to talk to their consumers? In, how do they approach their consumers who are demanding a lot more transparency? You know, the world we live in now, consumers are more demanding. They are, although one of the things that I think is very important is to understand the limits of people's ability to absorb the information that we deliver. You can see that even in politics, even among people who are supposed to be expert, how difficult it is to capture the full complexity of the things that they're doing. You know, I'm sure that lots of people who advocated leaving the European Union were unaware of lots of the complexities of leaving it. And by the way, lots of people who advocated remaining were unaware of the complexities of remaining. Um, so one of the things that I think all corporations do, but particularly in this very complicated area of pensions, is they assume a greater knowledge of what people are receiving uh, that and what they're paying in than people actually have, that they would understand a term like DB, um, which obviously in the industry is completely standard, uh, but for most people is not. And um, I think we, 
we do want transparency, but we also have to be very careful not to overestimate people's ability to follow some of that technical detail. So hang on to your expertise, if you like, in, in this tricky time. Well, you obviously yourself need to have expertise. We all know that you know, maths can shed light on things and um, knowledge uh, helps you make forecasts, although it can also over, you can also over-correlate for your expert knowledge. So we all know uh, this isn't to attack expertise, it's simply to be fully aware of the ways that one's consumers and members and contributors think and not to overestimate how much they're able to themselves deal with the detail, that that is something that companies have to help their consumers navigate through and shouldn't overestimate what people are willing or able to spend time grasping. There was a lot of conversation yesterday about how times like this demand um, a, a breadth of thinking, a cognitive diversity to help bring stability. Do you believe that's a sort of valid point? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I, I've become very interested in in my work is uh, how much we've learnt about the brain and uh, the way that people think. When I studied economics uh, in, in the early 1980s, we had this very simple model. We all knew it wasn't true. It was just a, a model to help work through the problems of economics. But as economics has developed, we've begun to understand how profound relaxing some of those assumptions about rationality are. That loss aversion, for example, is incredibly important, or that cognitive dissonance is incredibly important. And I think there's lots now of academic and intellectual work that can really help people understand how people, let's, for example, use a term, understand fairness. That's a very important term for any pension company that's trying to look at how to deal with uh, its distribution of assets uh, to its members. And uh, understanding what people mean by fairness, what they think of when that term comes, that is very important. And there's now lots of work that can help people to try to navigate their way through that. So industries that have been incredibly establishment, if you like, have, have got to become more flexible and, and, and move more with the times. It's very important to be aware just how rapidly our understanding of economics and of behavioural science is developing. And that um, in the last 10 years even, at an accelerating pace, we are understanding more of what people, uh, uh, how people respond to economic stimulus. And that hasn't always been integrated in traditional economic models. So uh, it's very important to understand there is a sort of politics to economics, that people follow each other, that mood matters a huge amount, uh, that uh, people don't act as independent rational uh, uh, actors, that they are very dependent upon each other, that they are also very dependent on decisions they've made in the past, that they respond differently to losses than to potential gains. All these things, uh, now there's a weight of scientific evidence behind them, and we can use that body of evidence, that body of scientific learning, to help us to develop uh, policies. And so, yes, uh, having a, an understanding of um, new thinking is absolutely part of the task of, of, of any company, however establishment. So that's evolution. What, what else will you be talking about today? And what messages do you hope the audience will take from, from your presentation today? Well, I I'm, uh, you know, appearing in front of a lot of pension experts. I'm not going to start lecturing them about um, pension uh, contributions or running pension organisations or uh, I'm uh, or, or, or saving. I'm going to do what I can do in an expert way and hopefully shed light on, which is to try to look at how a bit of how politics works and then to try to tease out what that might mean for the coming year to answer questions like, should we expect there to be a general election? Uh, should we expect there to be hard or soft Brexit? Uh, should we expect Jeremy Corbyn to survive? Um, those things which will help people understand the investment environment, the political environment, the economic environment. Daniel, what will you be predicting, if you like, and, and what will you be saying that the next 12 months holds for us all? Well, the first thing is, I don't don't really believe in soft Brexit. That's not to say I don't, uh, don't favour it or that I do favour it. I'm simply saying that I don't think that's the route down which we're headed. The government's been clear that we're not going to uh, try to be members of the single market when we're not in the EU. It's going to try to negotiate a free trade deal. I think it'll be hard to see that happening. So I think companies need to prepare themselves for a deal that primarily involves smoothing Brexit. Uh, in other words, trying to avoid um, 
the organisational and institutional bumps and try to ensure there's a smooth transition. I'll also be arguing that you shouldn't expect there to be a general election. People used to say to me, oh, David Cameron's about to call a general election and I used to uh, say well I've just been round to his flat and he's putting in a kitchen um, so it's not likely to be a general election any moment and um, the same is true with Theresa May she's just become Prime Minister I don't expect her to hold a general election I'll be addressing the question of whether Labour will get rid of Jeremy Corbyn my view is certainly not this year uh, I think the sort of forces against him are beginning to increase but there is what I call a market failure in political coups. All the costs are concentrated on the person who mounts it while the benefits are shared by everyone uh, and that means that you undersupply them as anyone who's an economist will understand that and um, therefore I don't expect that to happen. So those are among the issues I'm hoping to address. So if we're sat here in 12 months time Daniel what will we be talking about then? What do you think will be the hot topic? Well I think we'll then uh, some of the points that I've uh, been making about what will come in the coming year, well, I think becoming will be crystallising, and we'll be right in the middle at that point of the Brexit negotiations. I think it'll be becoming clearer how difficult it will be to get any sort of free trade deal, uh, and some of the practical obstacles to uh, smooth Brexit will be becoming clear. We'll be outlining them and trying to tackle those things. So I'm sure that next year we'll be right in the middle of that. And some of the things that are probably only clear to the experts in politics will be becoming clear to the experts in every industry and every and area. So I'm sure we'll be uh, discussing that. I think the talk of having a general election will be beginning to go away. Um, what we'll be discussing instead is, are we due for a period of political and economic turbulence? At the moment, everything seems politically very smooth for the government. Um, I think already even in the 24 hours since the budget that is beginning to change and so we'll I think by the end of the year I think the political atmosphere will be quite different. And any influence from Mr President Trump over in the United States do you think well, that will have an effect? It will do. He is very difficult to call. The, the, the primary thing about him in my view is not that he is a uh, a populist uh, or that he is very right wing it's that he gets most of his briefing from watching television and um, therefore it's extremely difficult to know uh, what he'll do because he's often quite ignorant of the issues in which he's engaging so it'll be interesting to see whether in a year's time simple experience means that he is less ignorant um, I wouldn't bank on that um, and that makes him very difficult to call it makes it very difficult to understand what he will do I think the British government is going to maintain a strong attempt to keep a global alliance with the United States of America and does see it as a potential trading partner as well um, and so I think that that will continue and by that time we'll probably have had a state visit by the president um, which will uh, I think set the tone for what's politically possible for the government in terms of relationships with America, whether it's successful or not. Fascinating times ahead. Thank Very you for sharing so. your thoughts, Daniel. Thank you.